So, so this is Angela Bischoff from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. Uh, and you'll be talking to us about uh, Ontario's energy future and, and, the, and the myriad of options, whether it's gas, nuclear, or renewables. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you for coming. Did I, can I go ahead and share my screen and just begin? Yes, please do. Okay. And then I go to slideshow. Okay. So you're seeing the full screen? I'll presume so. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you about climate change in Ontario and Ontario's electricity future and present. Yep. Uh, pardon? Yes. Okay. So the Ontario, I work with the Ontario Clean Air Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization, very grassroots based. Uh, we're small, we're three people. We are centered in Toronto, but we have been working all across Ontario for the past 20 years. We were formed in 1997 to call for 100% coal phase out. So at the time you probably will remember that we used to get about 50 smog days every year. And that was due to two things, cars and coal. And so um, Jack Gibbons and some environmental colleagues came together and said, well, let's start calling for the coal phase out, 100% coal phase out. And it was a very grassroots group. It wasn't it wasn't an organization yet or registered or anything. It was just some individuals, just like a few of us in this group uh, tonight came together and said, we have to phase out coal. And it was a really radical call at that time. And there was even a debate amongst the environmental community. Some said it was way too radical. And some groups even said, no, we're calling for 50% coal phase out. And you know, groups were competing for funding. And in the end, we prevailed. The Ontario Clean Air Alliance was formed and uh, they maintained their commitment to the 100% coal phase out. They were very political, very strategic, and it took 17 years, but Ontario phased out coal for environmental and health reasons. And we're probably, um, you know, the first jurisdiction in the world that did so, phased out coal for environmental and health reasons. And following our lead, the rest of the world is now also phasing out coal. Uh, but Ontario was the first jurisdiction. Now, of course, Canada is committed to phase out coal and other provinces are slowly moving in that direction. Uh, but Ontario is the first and it was a grassroots coalition. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the lessons learned from that campaign, which now, um, you know, informs our current campaigns. So once uh, winning that campaign to phase out coal, we turned our attention to moving Ontario to 100% renewable electricity grid. And that means phasing out nuclear and gas. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, <clears throat> our current campaigns. And we, we focus exclusively on Ontario as well. Uh, so this is Ontario's electricity grid in 2018. Um, it's I should have a 2019 update, but I don't at this point. So this is the best I can give, but it's pretty close. You'll see the bulk of Ontario's electricity comes from nuclear power. This is very unusual. We are the second most nuclearized jurisdiction in the world, second only to France. France gets 75% of their electricity from nuclear power and they're committed to reducing that to 50%. The rest of the world is phasing out nuclear reactors when they come to the end of their lives and moving renewable. <clears throat> Ontario, unfortunately, is going a different direction. So, but this is our hydro grid, 60% nuclear, a quarter of our electricity comes from water power, which is a renewable water source, especially given, you know, the um, Niagara Falls is uh, a, a flow through source. So we're not even creating dams, which is even better. 
gas in 2018 was 7%, now it's 6%. So the, the provincial government, the wind government had been reducing gas substantially over the last decade. They reduced gas, I think 15% <clears throat> over the last decade. And, um, and that was essentially, or from 15% down to 7%. And that was essentially just through conserving, reducing the demand up for gas and increase and building out wind and solar. So they brought in the Green Energy Act in um, 2009, and they started building out wind and solar. Initially, prices were very high, and there was lots of opposition to it. And uh, of course, we know that Doug Ford, when he was elected, he canceled all of those programs. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a bit about each of these fuel sources as well as we go through the presentation. So this shows Ontario's emissions specifically specifically from the electricity sector. So you can see um, at the left of the graph at 35 million tons was uh, per year was 2005. And the wind government brought those, and the McGuinty government brought those numbers down to 2017. They was the all time low. Um, they reduced emissions to, to like substantially. And starting 2017, emissions started rising and will continue to rise. And you can see 2000, was it 2019 that Doug Ford was elected or 2018? I don't quite remember that, maybe 2018. Anyways, emissions are now projected to rise substantially. From 2017 by 2030, it will be, a, to 2025, sorry, is it 30, is a 300% rise in greenhouse gas emissions from the electricity sector. 300% rise by 2025 and 400% rise by 2040. So at a time when the world is committed to reducing emissions, and in fact, the Ontario government is committed to reducing emissions, the Doug Ford government is ramping up emissions from the electricity sector massively. So what's be, what, why are they saying they need to raise, you know, need to ramp up gas or raise emissions? Um, one, the IESO, the independent electricity system operator, is projecting an increase in demand. So, you know, that's their projection. We could, in, that's their choice. We could instead uh, invest rapidly into conservation to lower demand substantially over the next decade. But they expect a rise um, for whatever reason of 1%, maybe, you know, electric cars greater population growth, et cetera. Also, the power station is expected to close in 2024. However, uh, that is um, disputed now by Ontario Power Generation. They're actually asking for another extension. But at this point, they have a license to run until 2024. And the government is planning to replace Pickering's output with gas. And then also the, the government is committed to, to meeting these increased demands, electricity demands, exclusively by ramping up the province's gas-fired power plants. So <clears throat> just to tell you a bit about the nuclear sector, since it's such a big sector of our electricity grid, I mentioned 60% of our power comes from nuclear uh, power in Ontario, and we have three of the world's largest nuclear stations. Pickering, Darlington, and Bruce. And both Pickering and Darlington are in the GTA. So Pickering is 30 kilometers as the crow flies from Young Street, downtown Toronto. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that is a picture on the left of the Pickering Nuclear Station. It's right in the middle of the city on a public beach where kids play and swim in the water. And the water around the Pickering Nuclear Station is really warm. It doesn't freeze all year. So kiters and boaters can actually play in the water around the Pickering Nuclear Station all year long because it's warm. I wouldn't, but you know, it's right in the middle of, of the Pickering town. Um, it has eight reactors. It's the fifth largest nuclear station in North America. And it's one of the, I, it's one of the oldest. 
Um, in fact, it's one of the oldest and largest nuclear stations in the world. <clears throat> Two stations were closed and uh, six are, were, were supposed to close in 2013. They got an extension till 2018. Now they've gotten an additional extension until um, 2024. Now OPG is saying they want to run it till 2025. It was designed to last 30 years. It's now 49 years old. And they've got permission to run it unt until it's 53. So we've we've had several campaigns to close the, the station in 2018 when its license expired. And now that they got the extension till 2024, we have a current campaign to immediately dismantle the, sta the station after 2024 when it supposedly shuts down. So as soon as it shuts down, OPG's plan is to let the station sit idle for 30 years before dismantling it. And we're saying they should dismantle it immediately. It's international best practice. It's recommended by the International Atomic Energy Agency as the best practice, the cheapest and safest way to, to deal with nuclear decommissioning. Plus, it will create 16,000 jobs. So that's a, that's a campaign that we actually got for the first time in the history of the Pickering Nuclear Station. The City Council, Pickering City Council, voted against OPG and supported the immediate dismantlement of the station after shutdown whenever it is, whether it's 2024 or 2025 or later. So that's our current campaign. And then um, the four reactors at Darlington, they want to rebuild, OPG is planning on rebuilding all four of those reactors. They've already rebuilt one and the other three are on the, on the table. And it's gonna cost $13 billion to rebuild that station and lock us into high cost nuclear power for another five decades. And then the largest nuclear station in the world is the Bruce Nuclear Station with eight reactors at Kincardine on Lake Huron. And uh, they're rebuilding all eight reactors. They've already rebuilt two. And again, there's a $13 billion expenditure that uh, taxpayers in Ontario, taxpayers and electricity rate payers are paying for. There were two reactors in Quebec. They, they closed them both after their 30 year lifespan. And there's one in New Brunswick, and they rebuilt that one reactor. So outside of Ontario, uh, New Brunswick is the only nuclear power commercial reactor. Okay, so let's look at the costs about of all these electricity options. At the far left, you have energy efficiency at 1.7 cents a kilowatt hour, and that is the most cost effective, the lowest cost, the cheapest, the lowest emission. Um, the, uh, creates the most jobs of all our options. Um, next, we have Quebec water power. Uh, we're buying, we bought some water, some water power on the spot market at 2.2 cents and that's what they're selling most of their power in the spot market because they can't get long-term contracts for a number of reasons, which I'll tell you later. Quebec is offering us water power, at, like long-term contracts, large amounts at five cents a kilowatt hour. Compare that to wind power. So Ontario bought wind in 26, 8.6 cents kilowatt hour. Since the, then the price has come down dramatically and you'll see the update box in the red box upper left. Uh, Alberta recently purchased wind at 4 cents a kilowatt hour and solar at 5 cents a kilowatt hour. So the price for wind and solar keeps nose diving. Well, meanwhile, the price for nuclear power keeps rising. So in 2020, we were paying OPG 9.5 cents a kilowatt hour for existing nuclear power. And at the far right, the yellow bar is 16.5 cents. That's what OPG is going to raise their rates to slowly each year um, to, at, in 2025 to essentially pay for the rebuilding of the Darlington nuclear station. So the price for nuclear power is, you know, triple of the price if we chose instead to purchase Quebec water power. And then this, the second to the right is the cost of SMRs or small modular nuclear reactors. And this is a new, you know, massive boondockle nu nuclear uh, black hole that the federal government, Trudeau's government, is choosing to invest in. And several provinces, including New Brunswick, Ontario, uh, and Saskatchewan, are committed to putting money into that as well. So the provinces and the feds are 
going to, you know, in small modular nuclear reactors, they're, they're all just on, on the books at this point. There's none that are built. They're all in um, experimental. They're just figuring them out. It's going to take best case scenario, 10 years before we get any electricity out of them. They're going to, OPG says they're going to cost 16.3 cents. Why? And we still haven't solved what to do with the radioactive waste. Which will be, which the industry says needs to be isolated from the environment for a million years. And then solar power is that beautiful blue bar. That was what we had purchased solar power for in 2016. Like I said, Alberta, the prices are only five cents. So the prices every year are just exponentially reducing for wind solar. So just, just give you the big picture there. Okay, so we're calling for uh, to a hundred percent renewable future phase out our nuclear plants. And how could we do that and lower bills at the same time? So there's four ways we can do that. One is ramp up energy efficiency investments. That's a lot option opportunity to buy Quebec water power and storage. So Quebec is offering us also. Uh, storage opportunities. So uh, they could back up, for example, Ontario's wind power. So when the wind's blowing, we use our wind and Quebec backs up their surplus hydro in the reservoirs. When our wind is low, they release the water down the reservoirs. And we so that's considered a storage at the, the lowest cost storage option. Three, we could buy cost effective made in Ontario green power. So that's wind and solar. Let's ramp up wind and the whole world is investing in wind and solar. Why is in Ontario? And fourth, we should we should cut back on rebuilding the, the 10 nuclear reactors and investing in small modular reactors, which are our most expensive options right there. Okay, so of those four options, I'm going to go through a few of them. The first one is energy efficiency. You'll see um, this the, the bar on the left. This is from 2005 to 2019, so that was a, a 14 year period. Electricity demand in the province of Ontario reduced by 10%. So that's how much the, the IESO the independent electricity system operator actually purchases our electricity, we buy it from, we buy it. And they reduce demand by 10% in the province. Amazing, you probably didn't even know that. It's not like you're wearing hats and sweaters in your home. It's just efficiency measures, making the homes more efficient, more comfortable, making industry more energy efficient, et cetera. At the same time, during that 14 year period, population growth increased by 17% and GDP growth increased by 22%. So there's the opportunity for energy efficiency to reduce demand at the very low, lowest cost. Um, and, it's, and it's also the greatest job creator of all of our options. And it, it creates jobs locally in people's neighborhoods and in people's communities. Okay, so our second option was Quebec water power. So Quebec power is reliable, low cost and available now. So those are things that we can't say about Darlington or Pickering or Bruce Power, for example. So Quebec has offered us long term supply contracts for five cents a kilowatt hour, which is less than a third the cost of rebuilding our aging nuclear reactors. And Quebec has massive surplus. They had a, you know, I know water power and especially damming large rivers like they did up in James Bay in Northern Quebec. Um, and there was a lot of opposition when they built those dams and the environmental community does not support building new dams. We don't support Site C or the, the Muskrat Falls. Uh, but the dams are already built in Quebec. They were built in the early 90s. And there's been some dams that have built since then and there's been massive opposition, but now the dams are there and there's no uh, existing movement to, to uh, bring the dams down. In fact, the Quebec government made uh, um, precedent setting deals with the First Nations, the James Bay Cree, and um, 
the James Bay Cree benefit financially when those sales are made. So for example, if Quebec were to sell more power to the New England states or to Ontario, the James Bay Cree would benefit handsomely. And so there's no opposition to those existing plants. First Nations are supportive of greater sales. Um, so while it's not the best option, you know, there's downsides to every electricity option. There's downsides to wind and solar as well for sure, but let's compare it with gas and nuclear and renewables. Let's put them all, and, and for many reasons, I think it makes sense for us to buy, um, to buy low cost Quebec surplus water power, which they do not have a market for. And part of their um, damming of all these rivers and why they have so much surplus is because they were expecting to sell their surplus power to the New England United States, but they haven't managed to build the transmission lines into the states because of environmental opposition to building transmission lines. So they don't sell very much to the New England states and they and also the, the New England states, there's competition, they don't want to import Quebec power. Just like Ontario doesn't want to import Quebec power. Ontario, we call, we call it electricity separatism. Ontario wants to create its own power, even though they're bringing in the uranium from Saskatoon or they're bringing in, or Saskatchewan, I mean, or they're bringing in the gas from the Pennsylvania basin or from Western Canada, or they were bringing in the coal from the, from the States. So, even though they're bringing in those powers, they're still, you know, generating the power locally or that, you know, they, they think they, they use the jobs argument for um, producing the power locally, but there's very few jobs created in the gas industry because the gas plants are already there. All they want to do is ramp up gas. Um, and there's essentially very, very few greenhouse gas emissions that will come from Quebec water power. Okay, so when it's available now, they've got surplus. We've got the grid between the two provinces. We could be importing it right now with the flip of a switch. In fact, we could have we could replace the win. The last win government was negotiating a deal with Quebec to import enough power to replace the Pickering nuclear station before it was to close in 2018. And that got scuttled because it was election year and the conservatives jumped on her for, you know, attacking local jobs because, you know, they wanted, I don't know, they're supporting the power workers union, I guess, and OPG. And so those negotiations uh, ended and they, and Doug Ford has shown no interest in negotiating with Quebec. The other thing about Quebec water power is it's available 99% of the hours of the year. So yes, 1% of the hours of the year when Quebec is in its peak, which is the winter time, for 1% of the hours of the year, they will not have power to send to Ontario. And we'll have to you know, crank up gas or use other, other uh, electricity options or conservation or demand side management to meet that other 1%. But compare that to Darlington, which is only available 83% of the time, or Pickering, which is only available 70% of the time. Quebec power is actually very reliable. Okay, in terms of lowering bills, we can look to the city of Cornwall. They have obtained 100% of their electricity from Quebec for more than 50 years. They're not on the Ontario grid, they're on the electricity grid, and they have the lowest electricity rates in Ontario. So, you know, when people say Quebec couldn't be reliable or something, let's just look at uh, uh, Cornwall, which is, it's been very reliable for them. Okay, so this is getting into a little bit of the weeds here, but I thought it'd be worthwhile. Um, Ontario can currently import, like we have a whole bunch of interties between the two provinces, Ontario and Quebec. And we currently can still import and all the, these numbers we're getting these from are from the IESO, the independent electricity system operator, all the numbers, the pricing, everything is, these are the government figures. So Quebec can currently import 16 to 18.5 billion kilowatt per year from Quebec with our existing transmission lines. That's equivalent to 73% of the annual output of the Darlington nuclear station. Like when they say it's peanuts or we, and that's just existing enterprise. Hydro One is investing $24 million, which is peanuts compared to the, the 
cost of the nuclear rebuilds, right? To um, increase, to import their power by 1600 megawatts in the next two years. And that's enough to replace two of the Pickering nuclear reactors. So like these are this large amounts of existing um, intraday inter capabilities to import water power that we already have. And then the ISO has identified three other projects. You'll see the cost on the right. The first one is 80 million, then 285, then 1.4 billion. These are relatively small projects, but they could each import 2000 megawatts of power. Um, and that's those, like two of those, so 4,000 megawatts of power. Like those are, so look at the pricing for just two of them, 80 plus 285, say $400 million, you could get 4,000 megawatts. And that's compared to uh, six of the Bruce reactors at $13 billion. So it just makes no economic sense to be rebuilding all our aging nukes when we could be focusing on Quebec water power. And that's just one option. Then there's conservation and wind and solar as well. Uh, and yeah, I didn't mention that Jack Gibbons, who's the lead of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance is an economist an energy economist. So he puts everything into um, dollar figures and that's the strength of the, the anti-nuclear campaign that we're running is the cost. They're just, it makes no, economic sense to be rebuilding our aging nuclear infrastructure when we have such lower cost, renewable, cleaner, lower emission, safer alternatives. So how do we as an organization strategically make our agenda happen of canceling the nuclear rebuilds and canceling the gas ramp up of 300% by 2025 and 400% by 2040. Well, we are uh, looking to the lessons of the coal phase out. This is how we did it. Those five little bars there, one, we sh how we did the coal phase out is first we showed that there were alternatives to um, burning coal to meet our electricity needs. We created a roadmap. This is how we could do it. Then we went to the public to build public support. Then we built allies within the NGO community, within you know, doctors and nursing communities. We built support with allies. Then we went to municipalities. So suddenly we had support from the public. We had groups that signed on. We created an alliance of the Ontario Clean Air Alliance, which had a hundred plus organizations. We went to cities and we started getting cities to sign on. I think we got about 10 cities to sign on to the coal phase out. And once the, the, the provincial uh, politicians started hearing from the mayors of their own cities, that stepped it up quite a bit. And we're, then, we, then we put the pressure on the opposition parties. So the, the governing uh, conservatives were uh, the government at the time. And we got the opposition parties on side, the NDP and the Liberals started putting pressure on the Conservatives. It was an election year, the Conservatives caved. <coughs> they were the first uh, government to call for the, coal, for the coal phase out. Then they lost the next election, McGinty was elected and he had made the commitment pre-election to call for the coal phase out. So once he was elected, he made it happen. And the liberals you know, made it happen with, with the push from the Ontario Clean Air Alliance and the public municipalities that continued to push them because they kept trying to delay um, the rollout of the, phase, of the phase out, but it eventually it happened. So, so we're using those same five steps to inform the gas phase out. And so this is our roadmap. We've come up with, you know, how could we, how could we power our province without gas-fired power plants? So we don't, we do address the nuclear a little bit here, but we created this report specific to the gas-fired power plant and started um, building support first with the public. So um, these are leaflets that we've, we've. I'm not sure what the tally is, but maybe you know, 60 or 80,000 of these leaflets are out there in volunteers' hands, whether they've all made it to the mailboxes, I'm not sure, but they're just being distributed mostly around the GTA by volunteers. Bruce Hansen, who's one of your members, Rena Boyd, who's one of your members, um, have distributed in the East End. 
Um, and lots of people are like more than 100 volunteers are distributing these around the province in in their design they full, they open up and we had a copy but they're designed so the back half of the, of the leaflet goes inside the mailbox and the front half hangs out so they're very secure and they basically just lay out the 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 campaign i should just say um they lay out the the big picture of that we should be phasing out gas that the province wants to ramp it up 300 percent in the next six five years and that we need to be phasing it out and it, it calls on people to sign a petition and once they sign a petition a letter goes to doug ford and all the party leaders and um and there's a box for the person to toggle saying uh you know add me to your email list and so in in, in doing so everyone who signs or most like about two-thirds of the people who sign also toggle the bo the box that says keep me informed and so the database is growing of people who are very keen to move ontario to a renewable future and every time we send out a bulletin to these tens of thousands of people growing on our list the bulletin always has an action component which says click here to send a letter to the premier or click here to send a letter to the minister of finance or whatever and the last time we did that so it's growing every time we send out a bulletin the last one got 800 sorry 975 letters sent to all the leaders of the four major parties in ontario i think it had to do with um that we don't want an SMR, small modular nuclear reactor, to be built at Darlington because that's, I didn't talk about that in my presentation, but that's their latest push. So anyways, if we can get a thousand letters sent to their mailboxes on an issue, that's pretty substantial. And this is how we're building public support. So that's, that's the first um, of those, the second of those five steps was to build public support. First was the roadmap, now the public support. And this just shows that we are now, we're building our allies support. At this point, we have 56 groups that have already signed on to the gas plant phase out campaign, including the Green Party of Ontario, Environmental Defense, Toronto 350, Solar Share, Toronto Environmental Alliance, the Wilderness Committee. So we're building this this coalition of groups that uh, is behind, behind this campaign. Then now we're going after municipalities. So now we've got you know, a critical level of support of the public behind us, of um, organizations, 50 plus organizations. And those organizations are in those municipalities, like in Kitchener, there's uh, you know, environmental groups that are pushing the Kitchener Council to pass a resolution to support the gas plant phase out. And to date, we now have 11 municipalities in southern Ontario that have all called for the gas plant phase out. And that's just going to grow in the next few months. We've got several other municipalities that are going to pass similar resolutions. We've got groups in Toronto, in Ottawa, in Kingston. So we're building campaigns to put pressure on the provincial leaders. Provincially, we, um, the Green Party of Ontario has signed on. No word from the NDP leadership, no word from the Liberal leadership. They won't meet with us. We've met with several Liberal uh, MPPs and several NDP MPPs. So the, ND, the MPPs are very supportive and get it but until the leadership of the party jumps on um th there's there's nothing for us to hang on to so the whole idea is to be putting pressure on these opposition parties to start bringing it up in the house imagine or in the legislature imagine if all the parties were talking about it railing about how greenhouse gas emissions are rising and why is the government ramping up gas so that's where we know we're going to make uh, headway is when the opposition parties get on side. So this is our um, petition, ontarioclimateaction.ca. I invite you all to go and sign if you haven't already. Toggle the thing which says keep me in the loop on your campaign and you'll get 
emails from me at the Ontario Clean Air Alliance probably every two weeks. And they usually have, give you an action um, for you to send a letter, make it really easy. We, we use, you know, we pay for the tool. So all you'd have to do is click here and you can type in your name and an email will always go to your own MPP. And now we're building a similar action, which I'm sorry, I forgot to put it in this presentation. We're building a similar campaign right now to, um, to go after Christia Freeland, who's Canada's finance minister, and her riding is the is um, what's it called um, University Rosedale. So it's a very central riding, and we intend to go door to door in her riding with a new leaflet, calling on the federal government to not support an SMR to be built at um, Darlington. So another, you know, another nuclear boondoggle in the middle of the GTA, no solution for the nuclear waste, and it's going to cost billions of dollars and the Fed, maybe the, the province won't do it if they don't get support from the feds. So we want the feds to pull out. In fact, that's what happened a few years ago. Um, the province wanted to build new reactors, I think at Darlington, and they were expecting federal support and the feds pulled out. And when the feds pulled out, uh, George Smithman at the time looked at the financing and says, we cannot do this without the feds. So that canceled the, the new builds at Darlington. And likewise, we're, the campaign is hoping to have the same sort of response if the feds pull out of, of supporting this, um, this new nuclear reactor at Darlington. So if you're interested in helping distribute the the gas leaflets and or the um, SMR leaflet in Christia Freeland's riding, I would invite you to reach out to me, Angela at Clean Air Alliance, and I'll set you up. I've got maps. I'm like coordinating the whole, well, I'm recording, coordinating all of the GTA in terms of the gas leaflet. So we, we know we'll never do the same house twice. Um, and likewise, we'll be doing the same thing in University Rosedale with the gas with the SMR leaflet and that's it. So I know that was a lot of information. I look forward to, I'm trying to unshare. I look forward to any comments or questions you might have for discussion. Angela, I, I know you mentioned me and, and I just wanna say that uh, I have distributed about, I think uh, upwards of about three and a half, four thousand of those flyers. And a lot of people have the no junk mail notice but once they hear what what it's about no one virtually no one has said i don't want your flyer once they hear what i'm saying that it's about electrical generation on in ontario and a greener option they they grab it out of my hand and say tell me about it so when you're when you're distributing these flyers and you see all those no junk mail signs they don't refer to this flyer it's not junk yeah thanks so much for all your efforts bruce definitely and bruce actually volunteered to if if there are people in this group which is you know east toronto if you want to be distributing bruce will help will help uh set you up with leaflets and and maps that kind of thing but I'm here to support that effort as well. But yeah, the, the, if you see, in, like we're just popping them in mailboxes, we're not actually knocking in do, on doors. Right, right. Yeah, you can get way more leaflets uh, distributed, generally a hundred leaflets in an hour. No, I don't, I don't knock, but yeah. occasionally someone's sitting on their porch or yeah. you, you know, nearby. And, and then for those very few people, I, I tell them what what the flyer's about, and uh, and then their ears perk up, and they say, "Tell me more." So awesome! Thanks, Bruce. I know you're like the star volunteer in the East End. It's a great team. Thanks for yeah. your work, Angela. Great. Any questions or concerns or thoughts, Don? Um. First of all. You've just answered a whole bunch of questions that I had, and thank you, thank you, thank you. This is great. <clears throat> I've been really curious about nuclear and just know some kind of technological questions, but um, it's like 
cost? Thank you. Um, so um, two questions came to mind. Um, uh, I'm curious to know what, what are the storage solutions for um, uh, solar and wind? Because, you know, we, we, my understanding of the way they're best used is um, there are times when they, when we create a little bit of extra power that way and we need to store it because there are times when we need it. Um, how, how, how do you suggest we tackle the storage problem? And the second question is real quick, Toronto Hydro. What Good about Toronto? Toronto? Well, where, where are they on this? Because they could um, <clears throat> string a couple of power lines from Quebec and um, turn off the switch for a couple of uh, gas plants if they wanted, I think. Okay, so um, in terms of Toronto Hydro, I, I, like Toronto Hydro doesn't, it, it's, um, it's Hydro One, the transmission lines that bring the power into the province. Mm. So Toronto Hydro could do more wind, could do more solar, for example, and combined heat and power, and they could do more local, you know, geothermal. They could invest more local investments into renewables within the city. Um, but they don't have the power, or they could lobby the province to say they want to buy more Quebec water power, but it's really Hydro One directed by the IESO that the IESO says we want to buy more uh, Quebec water power rather than more gas power. And those, and the IESO gets their marching orders from the government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the Ford government says we want to invest in nuclear and then the IESO figures out how it all fits in. I see. Okay. The, the and the other, in terms of storage, so yeah, I mean, that's the weakness of wind and solar is they require batteries for storage, which is a very high cost uh, option at this point. But, and that's where the brilliance of Quebec's reservoirs comes into play. The, the MIT did a study which said Quebec's reservoirs are our lowest cost option at this point, much lower than batteries or pump storage or any of the other options. Quebec's reservoirs are what, what, what the New England states should be using for, uh, for backup storage of wind and solar or other renewables. So that it's Ontario's opportunity to take to buy storage from Quebec. And Quebec is offering these options to us. Sorry, I'm on the bed and it, it keeps moving. <laughs> uh, so that's what we think is the our storage backup for wind and solar. Um, just to <clears throat> that, thank you. Um, the one of the things about Ontario Hydro, <clears throat> to my understanding, um, that um, there's a <clears throat> pardon me that the board of directors um, is uh, dinosaur laden. And uh, that, um, uh, oh, I, I talked to Councillor Layton about this a little bit. And um, when, um, I'm not sure when um, the, the next um, board of directors positions will be coming up, but um, it would be, and the mayor basically makes these appointments, but, it, but you know, Toronto Hydro is a large influential organization. Um, be kind of neat if, uh, we had people with a um, broader perspective, um, just mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? I see that uh, Lowell has uh, it's got his hand raised and it looks like Rose wants to speak. So go with Lowell and then Rose. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Angela. Thank you for your information. Uh, just, I want to, I guess, just bring up two things. Um, George Monbiot. Um, I don't know if you guys, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just reading one of his older books, but he seems to be, he's an Oxford grad, um, left wing, and, but he is so succinct and he's so, uh, what's the word? Uh, yeah, I follow him a lot. I respect him so much. And he, he's friends with Greta. <laughs> he made a great, uh, best uh, climate change video, I think, uh, a couple months ago with Greta. Anyways, uh, with BBC. But he, yeah, he's uh, he's pro nuclear because what, he's saying that. What, sorry, Lowell, what, what's, your, what's your question? Could you okay, all right, my because 
of the high standard of living that we have to sustain that, um, he thinks, because he was giving the example about the uh, Fukushima and how it didn't really affect, you know, not that it, it wasn't as big of a disaster as uh, people had um, anticipated. But uh, anyways, and then the other question I have in my mind is that from, you know, I'm, I'm an architect. I, I would go to these, you know, lectures that uh, a couple of years ago now, at these, you know, um, trade shows, uh, paid lectures and talk about and the building scientists talking and my conclusion is that and also the Michael Moore film I don't know if you saw that over the COVID <laughs> once and um, um, renewables especially for our you know single family detached homes that are you know, getting bigger and bigger are not um, they cannot um, heat our um, they, they call them leaky leaky homes that we've been building um, air leaking and like that's why, and especially, and also that they are heated by air ducts, which is not the most uh, um, efficient way. So, in order to, you have to fire up furnaces to like a uh, thousand degrees to um, to bring the hot air to the to the rooms, and yeah. So, renewables I don't think can power that. Is that not true? Can I ask that? Thank you. Okay, well, so just to preface, I'm not an expert in renewable energy by any means, but uh, I'll address the George Monbiot thing. So it's true, George Monbiot is really highly respected climate activist, auth writer, journalist, and he's very involved with Extinction Rebellion. So he's as radical as they come and as high profile as they come, and he he thinks nuclear is okay and another person who thinks nuclear is okay is probably the highest profile climate activist on the planet james hansen so in the states so he's also pro-nuclear and he's actually advocating in support of nuclear but i can say that like across the board probably you know the vast majority of the environmental community and high profile environmentalists you know Naomi Quine like across the board everybody is anti-nuclear except for a small number of people who yes are pro-nuclear and that's a real problem for the for the nuclear the anti-nuclear community we just have to accept that there's some dissension dissension within the community and there's you know, some people are looking at certain science and others are thinking it's a waste of money and why would we waste decades of time and when we, you know, we can lower our emissions by investing in conservation, by, you know, flying less, by using renewable energy like geothermal power to heat our homes. We have the technology that is that is lower impact, lower emission without the risks that are are going to come with nuclear power. We still haven't, after 50 years of having of the nuclear industry telling us they're going to solve the waste problem and the, the danger problem, they still haven't figured out these very fundamental, it's like building a house as an architect and not building a toilet. You would never get away with that. And the industry still continues on this trajectory that they're going to solve the problems later the next generation they don't want to decommission pickering for 30 years they're going to let the next generation pay for it so uh, enough already we haven't solved these problems we have we you know renewables aren't perfect either there's waste created you know from the various you know there's going to be wind turbines around the world that are but that are going to need to be recycled and we have to figure out all the problems with the rare metals that we're using in the solar panels. There's problems with all of these options, but we we weigh them one we weigh them against each other, and the environmental community across the board, with yeah. some exception, thinks that they're right. waste. Yeah. Lowell, can I interrupt? And I think sure. Rose had her hand up uh, sure. okay. a few minutes ago. Yeah. Sorry. Are you done? <laughs> um, I'll just say one quick thing about that, um, just to add to what Angela's saying. There's two questions too. One is nuclear power globally, and then there's Ontario. And the situation here is that we have hydropower. So, or, you know, there are 
So, so those are two things that, that we can look at. But my question for you. When you say hydropower, do you mean water power? Yes, what you're, uh, sorry, to be clear, what you're talking about that we have reasonably priced um, uh, electricity from Quebec that, that you're describing. Um, so my question for you was just um, a clarification maybe, maybe I missed it, but you said that um, Quebec has a lot of power available that they're not currently selling to New England. Now, is that because they don't have long-term contracts or like, what do they do with the power? They, they just send it over to dams. They just, they wow. can, they're not selling. They're not able to sell it. They, they have, they, and they sell a lot of it on the spot market. So at really cheap rates, like at 2.2 cents, Ontario buys some power from them on the spot market at 2.2 cents. New England states buy some of it. They just have very few, I think they only have two long-term contracts to the United States. Mm -hmm. And that's because of competition in the States, the, the United States, they wanna use their own gas mm -hmm. or their own renewable power or whatever it is that they use their own nuclear power. So they don't want the competition from Quebec just like Ontario is refusing the competition from Quebec. We're choosing to rebuild our nuclear reactors instead of bringing in water power because the only answer they come up with is jobs. They're, they're keeping the jobs in Ontario. And also they, there's been environmental opposition to building transmission lines into the, into the states. So they don't have the capacity. We've got the capacity. We've already got all, all these transmission lines crisscrossing the two provinces. So um, we're, we're in way better position to access that power than the New England states are. Just to, just to clarify, we, we're not using Quebec power because of Ontario jobs. Like we want to keep the power generation jobs in Ontario. Right. Interesting. Uh, uh, yes. I could clarify, we are... We have the wind government because of the advocacy of our organization, they made two uh, deals with Quebec in the last five years. They made two relatively small deals and just to see if it would work and you know, just to sort of break the ice. There was no, none of the other parties opposed the, these purchases. So then they, you know, they did the first one, it was a trial balloon, there was no opposition. They did a second one a little bit bigger, no opposition. They were in the midst of negotiating the third when, uh, and it was for eight terawatts. So quite a bit of a much, much larger contract. And uh, the conservatives caught wind of it. And they just brought it up in the house and they made it a big issue. The wind government's gonna, you know, cancel jobs, close Pickering mm. and, when just it was an election year, remember how the whole everybody was just on her, and so she just pulled out pulled out of that those negotiations, and they've just never been resurrected. Thank you, Angela. Uh, I, I I saw that Nick had his hand up just now. Uh, yeah, we had um, I can't remember who it was that was speaking, but he said that there's a problem. <clears throat> with the grid between Toronto, between Ontario and Quebec, because there's a part that comes through Ottawa that has to be shut down due to uh, flooding on the canal at one point or another. And it's not a reliable thing because it occurs too frequently with the climate change causing it more often. Um, is that being addressed or do you know? I've never heard of that. And all of the options that I had in my presentation where I showed the various options, that those were all identified from the IESO as potential intertie expansions to bring in more power. So I don't know if that's true or not. Um. I think one thing I would like to ask about is the de sorry the um, the decrease in energy use due to efficiency. Uh, I'm kind of curious if you have a bit more information on that. Um, what could I say about that? I could say that um, we I could I could say that we've barely scratched the surface 
of mm. the opportunity to conserve. Right. There's so much more opportunity that we haven't, like it's still only, like as it becomes more expensive, and we do have some slides on that. I'm sorry, I just don't have them at my fingertips. I have them on my computer. I could pull them up with a bit of time. But um, like at this point, on average, we're only spending 1.7 cents. And if we decided to, like we've been saying, we should spend as much on conservation as we do on nuclear power. So right now, we're paying OPG 9.5 cents a kilowatt hour to buy electricity. Mm -hmm. We should spend up to 9.5 cents a kilowatt hour to invest in conservation to reduce our demand, which causes no radioactive waste, mm -hmm. few emissions, creates local jobs in local neighborhoods. But, you know, government is, is essentially protecting the jobs of the nuclear industry at the expense of the taxpayer and the rate, you know, the rate payer, and at the expense of, you know, local jobs are all around the province, because if industry didn't have to pay high electricity rates, they could create more jobs that would incentivize industry all around the province. And likewise, if we weren't spending these high dollars on building new reactors and instead put that money into conservation, which is a fraction of the cost, we could roll out jobs all around the province. I mean, it's, it's a job creation program as much as it is an emission reduction program. Uh, Don? Um, <clears throat> first of all, my understanding is that um, there's a lot of jobs created uh, in decommissioning reactors, and they're uh, are surprisingly long term. <clears throat> but the real question I had actually is, do you have any idea <clears throat> what the impact of um, uh, going electric with our vehicles will have um, on the demand for electricity? Okay, good I'm question. sure it's a common question. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll answer both those questions. First, decommissioning. So OPG, I mentioned, they don't want to decommission Pickering when it closes for 30 years after shutdown. And we're, we've done, we've estimated that by immediately decommissioning the station, I mean, based on OPG's own estimates, it would take 10 years. And, um, and the Atomic Energy Agency says they should do it immediately. That's best practice. And it would create 16,000 person years of employment over the 10 years. So we agree. The best thing, you would think the unions would support that instead of have the, the, the metal hunk sit on the waterfront for 30 years with nothing happening. Why wouldn't the unions be supporting immediate decommissioning? But we haven't gotten the unions on side with that one yet. A lot of jobs. A, A lot, lot of jobs. Of jobs. <laughs> exactly. And think of how many watches could glow in the dark. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, and your other comment was, what was your other question? Um, the impact oh. of um, plugging in all the vehicles. So the ISO said, did a study, like it was maybe a couple of years ago, they said 1 million new EVs on the road in Ontario would only increase demand by 2%. And if all the vehicles in the province went electric, that's trucks and everything, it would increase demand 17%. So that's gonna be a while before all the vehicles are EVs, but even if it was, I imagine we could reduce demand by 17% pretty easily just by investing in conservation and demand side management. Thanks. Seventeen percent is a lot. Yeah, that's all the vehicles. But that's but one million vehicles. Imagine one million vehicles. That's only two percent. I'm not being critical. I'm just no. <clears throat> observing that seventeen percent, which is what we'd like, is a lot. Well, look at we reduced demand ten percent over what was that fifteen years? That that chart I showed. We did, and nobody even knows we did it. Like it was it was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so could we do another 17 percent i'm sure we could uh so so angela i'm noticing a lot of hands up i think nick uh rose and bruce uh but we're also at 8 30. i'm wondering if you if you need to if you need to go or if you're okay staying around to you know chat some more i'm fine this is a good conversation cool uh I, I, I'm, I'm not too sure honestly i'm not too sure who put up their hand first uh, I'm wondering if we can. Well, Bruce hasn't spoken yet. Let him go with Nick first. 
I'll let Bruce go. He hasn't spoken yet. Thank you. Angela, uh, Alberta ha has an open market. And, and that's, from what I understand, the reason why uh, wind and solar are still growing tremendously in Alberta. Is there any appetite uh, in, in the conservative, uh, Ontario conservative government for, for looking at a market-based mechanism? for truly opening the market or, or, or is the nuclear industry just too, too strong an influence on them? What, what do you think about, the, about them being open to the market? It, well, so the, the Wynn government opened up a competitive bidding process. So when they started the Green Energy and Economy Act in 2009 and started purchasing wind and solar, they, it wasn't an open market. They were purchasing at very high rates. Then the rates slowly started coming down, down year by year. And then in 2016, they did a uh, competitive bidding process. And that's where the prices came way down to 15 cents for solar and eight cents for wind. And so that was a competitive market. You would think that the conservative government, the bastion of capitalism would love uh, you know, competitive markets and invite the lowest cost supplier to come in and provide us with power. Instead, we're, we're hamstrung by this, by this crown corporation called OPG, which has a, the whole province by the whatever. Um, because they, they, they don't have a monopoly on the market, but they have a monopoly on nuclear power. And we just, we're just rebuilding all their stations and it, it makes no economic sense especially coming from a from a conservative government which should be all about free market so yeah the, the nuclear lobby is just so strong that uh they're just so powerful that even the wind government couldn't you know couldn't get beyond the the, the nuclear uh influence and the and the, the tories are no different which is hard to believe because you know ford is a businessman thank you angela uh i'm wondering if we should go to nick after this and then rose maybe yeah i was wondering doesn't opg have a mandate to actually make up reasonable economic whatever you wouldn't want to call it i know they're not supposed to be in it for profit or are they uh no they're just protecting their jobs you know the money that they they yeah and they make a lot of money like have you they're all on the uh sunshine list if you ever looked at some of the like they're all making hundreds of thousands of dollars even I understand even you know the people mopping up the floors are making over 100 grand so there's I don't know what is it 16,000 employees or something that work for OPG and Bruce Power on on the sunshine list and maybe Bruce Power wouldn't would Bruce Power be on the sunshine list anyways they're they're very high paying jobs and they're protecting their jobs and no they're not bound to they're not competing on the marketplace with wind and solar or water or conservation or anything. They just, they just decide what they're going to charge us. And they're making a lot of money in the process. It feels like we made a decision as a province like decades ago, and now we're just kind of living with it. Yeah, but we wouldn't, we don't have to rebuild all of our aging nukes. That's a, that's a current decision we're making right now. We could cancel them at any time. Mm. But even uh, the government was committed to rebuilding them. So I don't, I don't know why Kathleen, I would love to have that conversation with Kathleen. Progressive on so many fronts, but pro, you know, even pr progressive on green energy and conservation and phasing out gas, but still committed to rebuilding our aging nukes. I don't know mm. why. Uh, Rose, uh, please ask your question. Sure. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but the topic of microgrids, I, I wanted to put solar panels on my roof when I replaced my roof, and it didn't work out. Um, and I can't sell, I wanted to actually double, or like for the amount that I wanted to put on, 
I can't sell the excess to my neighbors. Now, I, knew, I heard that in Brooklyn, they set up a microgrid. I think this was after Hurricane Sandy. Um, it, do you know of a jurisdiction that has regulations that permit this? Because I, I imagine that it's because they don't want consumers to compete with the local distribution company. But how do we, how do we get around that? I don't know. Can <laughs> Does anybody else want to answer that? Because I don't really know how to answer that. I, I imagine, you know, looking at Brooklyn to see what, what was going on there. I, I don't know if it was something special. Uh, I, I have no answer at all, but I, I just want to clarify, is this the idea of um, sort of centralized power, sort of power provided by the government versus, actually, I guess so, my... Right now, it would be government. illegal to sell back. It would be illegal for me to sell my excess power to anyone else. I'd have to sell it back. The only person I, the only entity that I could sell it to would be Toronto Hydro. And the rates are much lower than a couple of years ago, right? Is that what, is that the issue or it has been? Or... No? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I looked at the numbers. That that wasn't the issue. The, the issue I'm I'm focusing on is that they're they're it, right? And I guess this comes up with, um, you know, if we have electric vehicles, they're going to pick a couple of vendors, and everyone else, like you know, I could I could be selling, uh, you know, I could put a charging station in front of my house, but can't do that. Right. Oh, I, I just uh, went on the Toronto Hydro website and uh, under net metering, and they say uh, generate your energy from renewable resources. You may be eligible. Now I haven't read read uh, the program. I, I assume it's still in operation. Is is that what you want to do? Net metering. Well, that's the thing with net metering contracts. You sign a contract with Toronto Hydro and you sell all your energy to them. So if the power goes out, if there's a power failure, um, you're not allowed to use it. You're not allowed to use your own power if you get disconnected. So <laughs> there is that that's the way net metering works. So you, you know, I, I could try to do a net metering. So I, I'm just asking, yes, there's net metering. <laughs> um, but it's not conducive to me putting more, well, it could be, but. You can buy a battery, you can, you can buy the Tesla's battery and you can do that, but, but it's, a, it's a 13, 14 year payback if you're playing right. the, the, the different time of day rates to use it. I, I, I looked at it uh, five years ago and I, I thought it was not a, there was no business case to it for the typical homeowner. My understanding of <clears throat> microgrids is that they require very little battery because what you do is you connect your house to your neighbors and everybody has a little computer that says, oh, um, uh, the Joneses have a little bit <clears throat> of extra energy at the moment and the Smiths could use a little bit of extra. And, and mm -hmm. that's the idea behind a microgrid. <laughs> Uh, I, I oh. think Lowell has a question as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I jumping in. What was my? Oh yeah. So geothermal. Oh, that's two points. The uh, I understand it's not only expensive, but it's very difficult to do in existing buildings, right? Because they can't even get the equipment to to where they want to drill. Sometimes, yeah, I, I think that is true. And then, um, uh, what was my other point? Oh shit. Uh, oh my god, I'm sorry. It's. Uh, I have heard of the geothermal is highly efficient. Um, yeah, but it, it 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 has to work with um, it has to work with like um, um, uh, um, uh, radiant heating. You can't because you ha you have to build like Roman. You know the the you have to put the water ducts um, inside the concrete so that it can it can uh, it can have uh, thermal uh, energy. Um, radiant heat coming out from the floor, and that is very expensive. And, and no, you don't have to. No, you can have an air. It, it can work with air as well. This it, 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 it does not have to be water. No. What with 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 mini splits? You're talking about? Sure. Um, or yeah. or uh, you can you can have uh, a you can have a water to air. You can have a 
uh, look, with just spend ten minutes on Google, and you'll you'll find all the answers you oh, yeah. need. Okay, sorry. I just want to. I just want <laughs> my solution. At um, architectural solution, it's it sounds like a joke, but it's the idea of a, a solar chimney uh, that uh, some architects have done, I think, already in for bigger buildings. But out of earth, and it sticks out in the backyard, face south facing, and you use that in close energy from that ramped earth enclosure and you bring that warm air into the house and uh, you may not even need a building permit because it's less than 108 square feet okay <laughs> I, i'm wondering if that's something that any of us can do in our, our backyard or if that's something that we need to like reach out for a professional to do uh but i see that bruce uh bruce yeah i i i I mean, these are interesting um, conversations, but it, I'm 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 wondering since Angela, since you're here, if we could take advantage of your presence and get a sense of like, what do you see as like you you came to talk to us, so I I'm I'm thinking uh, you know you're building this alliance. What are you hoping that we'll do? What what what's your call to action for a small group like us? Um. Well, you could, as an organization, you could sign on uh, uh, to the Alliance. So right now we have 55 groups. If you're actually, you have a name, you guys could sign on, you send me your logo, I'll add you to our page. So that's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do is as a group, maybe commit to distributing some leaflets or individuals could say, I would like to help with that. You can reach out to me, Angela, Clean Air Alliance. I can mail you a box of leaflets or depending on where you live, maybe it's easier for you to go to Bruce Hansen's. He lives in Riverdale and you could pick up from him or I'm happy to mail boxes as well. And I, generally what I do is I mail a box for the number of hours that you think you can volunteer and a map around your house and just set you up on your own and you do, you know, five hours of volunteer time over a couple of weeks or whatever, pop them in mailboxes. That's basically, that's how we're getting them out and around the city. Um, or alternatively help with the SMR campaign and Christia Freeland's writing. Or if you're keen, like, well, for sure sign the petitions so that you'll be getting my regular updates and you can send letters regularly to the politicians. Mm -hmm. or um, and then, you know, helping with social media, for example, getting the word out. So by following the Clean Air Alliance Facebook page, sharing posts, being part of the conversation, just, you know, I invite everybody to be on the agenda with us through social media, through our lists, sending letters, meeting with your own MPPs, or your own MP, like the more you know about the issue, the more you're able to be writing letters and just engaging in electricity. For many of us, electricity is such a, you know, kind of foreign, how do we wrap our heads around it? I don't have a history of electricity myself around it. So I'm learning all the time. We're all learning how do we tell politicians, this is an important issue to us. How do we, if, if climate change is the issue that you guys are working around, well, gas fired power plants in the province and how we generate electricity in the province are really important components of you know a climate plan for the province so how do you engage as an organization by you know sending letters maybe as a group to various MPPs I, I'm just brainstorming here but mm -hmm. like how do we uh, use electricity as a opportunity to talk about climate change and vice versa mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, in your, if I could just ask a follow up, would that be all right? Yeah, of course. Um, so in your in your uh, um, presentation, you mentioned about municipalities that it signed on. I noticed Toronto was not on the list. Um, is there? Uh, what are the prospects for that? And again, is that an area where we could potentially um, put some pressure on local politicians to sign on to the campaign? Yes. So what what we did in, in Guelph and what we will do in Toronto as well is when it looks like it's coming before Toronto City Council, then we're going to have to reach out to all, all our supporters on the list. We'll send out a, a letter saying, hey, Toronto residents, click here to send a message to your 
local city councilor. And depending on what your postal code is, it'll it'll punch in the name of your counselor. So you don't even have to know your counselor's name. You just got to punch in the postal code. And they'll, you know, ideally we'll get hundreds of letters sent to every one of the city councilors saying, hey, we're paying attention how you vote on this issue. So that the one way for me to be in touch with all of our Toronto supporters is just from the list. We'll send out a bulletin when it's going to Toronto City Council. But also, I think, um, I guess I haven't really thought this through yet, but I would imagine when it's coming before Toronto City Council, I'm going to reach out to all the Toronto groups who have either signed on to the, the you know, the alliance, the gas plant phase out alliance, definitely all those groups that are connected to, to Toronto, which are a lot of them, and ask your groups to send out um, emails, which I'll formulate for you to send out to your members, saying click here to send a message to your city councillor. So the same action tool that I use to send to our list, I'm going to ask you your group to send it to your, you know, your list of 50 or 100 people on your email list saying click here to send a message. This is an issue that we want our local city councillor to um, be alert to that we're paying attention to how they vote. Because the question is, we've already got the councillors that are going to bring it before the whole Toronto City Council, but we have to then mobilize citizen support to reach out to all the other councillors to get them on side. So I will reach out to your group when the time is right with that action tool. So that's one little thing is, you know, we'll be sending letters. Um, I don't know that we'll, I'm not sure what we'll do beyond that, beyond like an email action list. Maybe we'll invite people to come to the city. See, everything's online now, so you can't fill the, the council chambers. I'm sure it's going to be in the next month or two that it comes before before council because it's part of the um, Toronto climate report that we've tied this gas plant phase out campaign. So they're bringing the next stage of that report before council, and I think we're going to tag on to that. We've okay. got some council support, but we're going to need to reach out to all the other councillors as well. Okay. Thanks for asking about that. I've made a note of all that and uh, we can, uh, we, we, I think as a group, we should have a, a discussion as soon as possible about how we want to um, follow through on everything we're, we're learning here. I know the gas power plant thing has, the gas power plants issue has been on our radar now for uh, pretty much since I joined Teak um, and we've been organizing uh, quite a lot lately about building efficiency and uh, I think when the spring comes around, we'll, we'll, we'll get active again in like community gardening. Those are two areas we want to focus on, but um, it, I'm sure that uh, we have enough capacity to uh, give some attention to this issue as well if we, if we put our minds to it, so. Super, thank you, mm -hmm. yeah. I'll keep you in the loop. I don't know who the contact is. Who's your contact, Ting? Yeah, you know, if you've established a, a, a connection with Ting, he's he's on our communications working group. So, um, mm -hmm. it, it, anything that you, uh, any communication you have with Ting, will get out to the community. So he's a good person. Okay, well, I'll send Ting uh, an invitation, sort of a formal invitation with links to join the gas plant phase out alliance. Sounds you guys good. Can discuss it or, uh, internally. I'll send you the links. Yeah, would that, be, would that be something that we should include in a newsletter as well? Yeah. I think so, right, yes, okay. Right. And including the, in the newsletter would be the a link to the petition. That's what you should circulate. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. I'll send you something, Ting, that, you know, some, a couple of paragraphs that you can cut and choose from. Cut and yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Uh, Kathy? Oh, thanks, Tink. Hey, Angela, thank you so much. Thanks, Kathy. Would it be possible to share the your presentation, the slide presentation with us as well? Yeah, I have already sent it to Ting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to put it on the um, the shared Google Drives. Uh, I might be able to put, make, like, make a 
post on Facebook or something. I don't know. Do you have access to the Google Drive? I think so. Me? Uh, you, Kathy. You can, you oh! Can up, Ting, we can set it up so that the membership would have access to any particular file. So that's not a problem. But uh, uh, also, I mean, we have the actual presentation on, uh, it's going to go up on our YouTube channel as well. So that's true. Yes. Great. Also, Bruce, can you save the chat uh, uh, before we end it? Yes, I'll definitely do that. I just want to get this into for, for Bruce, but as far Mark as I know, the, um, the heat pumps, it only works mostly in small spaces. If you have a passive house standard where the, you know, the, the walls are super airtight and you can put one, you know, mini split on one floor, and if the doors are open, but I and think we should take this offline. Let's, yeah, let's, all right. Let's okay. Email me. Yeah, I'll email you again. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, that's a, a great idea. Um, I guess uh, Ting, uh, are we? Uh, it's getting close to nine o'clock. Angela has really been generous with her time. Yes, thank, thank you, Angela. My pleasure, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. I, this was a great presentation. You filled a lot of my holes, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to send me any questions for follow up. I can send you links or whatever. Wonderful. Also, Angela, you forgot to say one thing. Some of us who are at home all the time need to get out more and to take an hour <laughs> and just walk briskly from door to door. It's very healthy. Exactly, I can't believe I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's contactless volunteer too. That's oh, right. Yeah, <clears throat> One, I have a volunteer that's been going out like an hour every day for the past month. He wrote me today and said he's lost six kilograms. That's, a, that's huge. <laughs> I know, and he wasn't even fat to begin with. Like, now, look, oh, look, wow. look, this is this is your pitch. <laughs> Don, if I could, I, I would like to invite you to actually write up the pitch and submit it <laughs> for the next newsletter. We can put it up for for the next several editions. Okay. I lost twelve yeah. kilos, and <laughs> you can too. Those gases at the same time. <laughs> Lose kilos in gas, lose weight in gas, yeah. lose weight and reduce gas too. <laughs> oh, we're getting punchy now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, everybody. Thanks for good local organizing. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you thank so much. Thank you, Angela. Hi, Kathy. Bye. Yeah, uh, so great to see you. Say goodbye. I'll say goodbye. If you guys want to talk more, you can talk more, and uh, or email me if you have questions. Okay. Yeah, I'll be sure to include your contact info. Yeah, send me a link if you post it. I can post it too. Awesome. I'll really post it again if you send it to me. Okay. So send it to me. Thanks, Ting. Bye, everybody. Long. Thanks again. Bye. Thank you.